I just saw the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, uh, before I came over here, and she wanted to remind you that this is officially and indisputably the best free event in Washington, D.C. And furthermore, you know, they make you pay to go to the Redskins. And furthermore, uh, it's better than most of the ones you have to pay for. So uh, uh, she uh, has wanted me to mention that. Uh, Peter Brannon, sitting to my left, is an award-winning science writer based in Boulder, Colorado. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Atlantic, and Wired. He's the author of The Ends of the Earth, Volcanic the ends Apocalypse. Of the um, ends of the world. Um, yeah, it's right here. Uh, <laughs> volcanic apocalypses, lethal oceans, and our quest to understand Earth's past mass extinctions. So, you know, your book's about five mass extinctions yep. that have happened on Earth. And uh, so, how did you come up with an idea to write a book like this? You're not even a science guy originally, right? Uh, well, you know, I've always I've, I've been a science journalist for about ten years, but. Um, yeah, I was actually working as a newspaper writer in uh, New England and writing a lot about the oceans. Um, and when you report and write about the oceans, you learn that a lot of things are going wrong in the oceans. There's things like overfishing and um, uh, nutrient pollution and upcoming threats like warming and um, ocean acidification, which is what happens when too much CO2 reacts with seawater. It makes it more acidic and it makes it harder for things to build their shells out of um, calcium carbonate to, to stick around. Um, and so I was learning about all this stuff, and then I did a program for science journalists at Woods Hole, and I noticed that all of them were, or some of them were studying ocean acidification. They were very scared about it. And some of them were studying events that had happened tens of millions of years ago. Um, and if you know how to read the rocks, um, and you're really clever about geochemistry, and you know your geology, you can actually go and see what happens when the planet runs the exact same sort of experiment that we're running on it today. Um, and I just thought that was, this is sort of at least half of the climate story, but that we have, our understanding of climate change is from studying how the only experimental record of climate change that we have, um, these experiments that the planets run. Um, and I thought that was sort of an untold story. And then when I started diving into that, I noticed that there was this interesting conversation going on in the ge geology community where, um, you know, there's this paradigm about, you know, I think in the, pop the pop popular imagination, I think people think mass extinctions are things that happen when at big rocks fall out of the sky and wipe things out. Um, because there was this uh, huge discovery in the 80s that was really solidified in the 90s that the dinosaurs disappeared. It seems to have something to do with um, a big rock hitting Mexico. Um, but when geologists went back to all the earlier mass extinctions, there's actually, what's incredible is that the dinosaur extinction is the most recent one. Um, and there's four older, and some of them are much more severe. And, uh, I think the end Cretaceous mass extinction, the one with the dinosaurs, ranks number four or something like that. Um, and when they went back looking for asteroid impacts, they couldn't find them. And instead, they found these huge injections of CO2 from volcanoes in some cases, and other cases, these tectonic events that um, drew, drew down CO2. So I just thought it was this um, people are both interested in natural history museums and all that, but there's also this news hook that um, we're starting to pull some of the same levers that are responsible for some of the worst things that have ever happened in Earth history. So that was sort of a roundabout uh, answer. You know, you know, one of the things, um, before we get into this, uh, really uh, drill down deep uh, on some of those issues, uh, one thing that strikes you when you read the book is the, there's a multitude of interesting character scientists that you talk to. And, and also, uh, you know, the, the kind of innovative science that's, that enables people to know with some accuracy, right, uh, what happened. Uh, hundreds of millions of years ago. So give, give us a little bit of a flavor of that. Yeah, well, I wanted to somewhat correct sort of this idea that paleontology is just people dusting off bones in the back room of some museum somewhere. It's actually a 21st sort of cutting edge science where, um, yeah, geochemists are using, you know, there's very sophisticated, expensive lab equipment where you can actually just look at, um, the composition of a rock can tell you a lot about what's happening on the entire planet at that time, which is kind of amazing. Uh, so the, the reason, how we know that um, the temperature tens of millions of years ago um, is because we've, or hundreds of millions of years ago even, is you can find limestone uh, laid down by uh, plankton that before it died, it records in its shell sort of the chemical signature of the ocean. And this can t tell you all sorts of things about um, you know, temperature, uh, CO, the, how much 
what's going on with the carbon cycle on the planet so that I can tell you whether there's big injections of CO2 into the air and things like that. But yeah, the people who are doing this work tend to be a very interesting uh, lot. And I wanted to tie each of this, these sort of remote alien things that no one's ever heard of to ground them in sort of personalities that are working on it. And there are very colorful people who work on this. So for instance, one person who I highlight much to the chagrin of a lot of paleontologists is um, the Princeton geologist Gerda Keller, because she's sort of an iconoclast when it comes to the end Cretaceous mass extinction. Um, she rails against the asteroid. She thinks it's totally overrated. Um, and she goes out of her way to sort of prod and provoke people too, I think. But she's a fascinating lady and she it's the youngest of seven in a Swiss farming family and ran away from home uh, when she was in her teens. She took a train across Africa and got really sick. She's on death's door. And then, then she went to Australia and she got shot in a bank robbery and was telling me about how she was, saw herself flying over Sydney. And then she ended up in San Francisco completely on her own. And I think she was noticed by uh, teachers as being very gifted. And then she went on to... Uh, college and became a, ge a tenured Princeton geologist. So that's just sort of. Yeah, w one of them. Yeah, that's one of the people I talk to, so. <laughs> and a lot of them aren't pro professional academics in the sense of teaching at universities, I noticed that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, so there's the professional paleontologist, but also I was really sort of, my eyes were open to this really inspiring, uh, just population of amateur paleontologists, people who take time out of, the, they take their weekends and they'll drive to random road cuts on a highway, which you would never notice, but um, because they know the local geology. So the one I, I, I go to Cincinnati, which it turns out is one of the most fossil rich regions in the entire world, which came as a surprise to me because my dad's from Cincinnati and he had no idea. Um, I hope he doesn't watch this video, but, um, <laughs> but they're called the dry dredgers, and they're these people who meet up at the University of Cincinnati and they drive out and they go look for, and, you, and when you join them and you go over to the side of the road, you can see it's just the rocks on the side of the road are just, it looks like a, a, someone just dredged a coral reef up onto the side of the road. There's seashells and um, trilobites and things that look like horseshoe crabs and big cone nautiloid shells and things like that. So. Okay, so time for a little perspective. Yeah. Uh, the Earth's, Earth's been here for a little over four and a half billion years, yeah. right? Um, how long has there been any sort of life on Earth? Uh, well, the first, so like single-celled life, 3.8 billion probably. Um, but animal life show, I mean, the Cambrian explosion, which people might be familiar with, and all these alien-looking things show up in the fossil record. The Cambrian begins 543 million years ago. Mm -hmm. So these numbers are all big, and it's hard to really... Uh, Grasp, and so I, you, the geologists have mnemonics for thinking about deep time because you just can't, you can't. Our brains weren't evolved um, in Africa to think about uh, quantum mechanics or deep time or distances in space. So you need to think in sort of similar terms. Where, so they all have these these tricks. And my favorite one that I use in the book is that if you imagine that every footstep you take is a century, and you go for a walk, um, you know, after 20 steps you're at zero A.D. B.C. Um, and you know, by the time you get to the exit, uh, woolly mammoths exist and all of human civilization sort of blinked out and we're going back into a major ice age when sea level's 400 feet lower than it is today and there's giant camels and ground sloths and uh, mastodons and mammoths where, where we are probably. Um, and that's only from here to the door. And to cover the rest of Earth history, you'd have to walk, you, you know, you might think, oh, you go another mile maybe and then you see dinosaurs. You'd have to walk. 20 miles a day for almost four years to cover the rest of Earth history. So those are the scales that we're talking about. And what's amazing, well, so what's so jarring about the extinctions is that that's how rare these events are. That, you know, once every, in this walk, once every few hundred miles, you might get to one of these big, scary catastrophes. And so we might sort of be at the beginning of one of the more interesting periods. <laughs> so uh, how long ago was the first extinction? First extinction was 445 million years ago. That is why I went to Cincinnati because. Um, so animals are, are you know close to 600. And then yeah, yeah. An event about 440. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have the. There's nothing on land yet. There might be some little sprigs of like uh, liverwort or something around fresh water. But for the most part, if you saw the continents, it would look like the Mars Curiosity rover feed. There would be nothing on land really. 
Um, but there's tons of life in the ocean, and there are these sort of bug-like things that I was talking about before, trilobites, things that look like horseshoe crabs and all that. And in Cincinnati is where you go to, to sort of introduce yourself to it. And, and at the end of this extinction, there was a massive ice age um, that dropped sea level hundreds of feet, and it wiped out all this habitat, and it changed the circulation of the ocean, so animals' foods disappeared. And this is actually the second, most, the second worst mass extinction of all time. And it's thought that you go into this ice age because of this weird tectonic mechanism that can draw down CO2. So today we're worried about CO2 going up too fast, but if you draw it down too fast, you can um, sort of freeze things. So that's how that one. Yeah, and so, uh, so there, were, there were, even before the dinosaurs, there were, what, four extinctions, right? And yes. this one's the dinosaurs. This is hundreds uh, of millions of years before the dinosaurs. Hundreds, hundred, yeah, and, and, and humans have only been here, what, 200,000 years or so, something like that? Uh, yeah, or, yeah. yeah, more or less. Yeah. And, and so what, what lessons are you drawing uh, from, you know, particular lessons from some of those extinctions, the early ones, say, pre, we'll, we'll, we'll say pre-dinosaur extinction? Yeah, so dinosaurs show up 235 million years ago. Um, and they actually go through one of the major mass extinctions. They need, they need a, the end Triassic mass extinction for them to take over the planet, sort of, because they had these weird crocodile relatives that had to get wiped out first. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the worrying thing about a lot of these earlier extinctions, so the worst mass extinction of all time is this thing called the end Permian mass extinction 252 million years ago. And by this point, you do have things walking around on land. They're sort of unfamiliar because people just like to go to see the dinosaurs at the Natural History Museum, but there is, there's cool stuff before that. Um, and there's trees and there's an ecosystem and there's coral reefs all over the planet. And um, at the end of the Permian, 252 million years ago, um, people went looking for uh, evidence of an asteroid impact and they couldn't find it. But instead what they found is that in Russia, um, enough lava erupted in Siberia that it could cover the lower 48 United States a kilometer deep. So it's not even worth talking about Yellowstone in the same book as, as this thing. Um, but even in, a, in an event as chaotic as that, the lava only, I mean, it covers like all of Siberia. If you go to Google Maps today and you see sort of dull brownish gray rock, that's from the Siberian Traps, which is the name of this volcanic rock. Um, but it only, part, it only covered part of Russia and everything on the planet dies. Everything in the ocean, or not everything, 96% of life in the ocean, um, a little less on land. Um, so it can't be just the lava in this one part of the world. It, it's the volcanic gases that are really doing the trick. And it seems like CO2 is the most important one because not only would the uh, volcanoes have put tons of CO2 into the air all on their own, but they came up through one of the world's largest coal basins and injected something like 80,000 gigatons of carbon into the air. So if we burned all our fossil fuels, it would be something like 5,000 gigatons, and this is 80,000. So this is completely off the scales. But what makes it worrying for today is that it actually turns out that the rate of emissions is more important in terms of life's ability to adapt than the total volume. So this is over uh, tens of thousands of years, these, these eruptions, whereas what we're doing in a century, um, it might be 10 times faster than those eruptions. Yeah. And just sort of the o ocean chemistry and climate really, and animal life needs longer time scales to adapt to a shift that's that Profound. We'll get back to that in a second. I, I want, just wanted to be clear on, because you, know, you have the, the Swiss-born scientist, yeah, yeah. and uh, she's sure that the rock that landed in Mexico didn't cause the dinosaur extinction. Yeah. So, so what did happen to the dinosaurs, and what lessons are, are drawn well, the we draw from that? The safe money is still on the asteroids, on the asteroid. But what is wild about that extinction is, so for the, pr the previous three mass extinctions before that, are associated with similarly outlandish uh, volcanic eruptions. And it just so happens that right at when the dinosaurs are going extinct, there's another one of these going on in India, um, which could cover the lower 48 states in 600 feet of lava. So not quite a kilometer, but still nothing to sneeze at. Um, and so she, and uh, yeah, so she implicates this, the, the Deccan traps, they're called, this volcanic event in India 66 million years ago, as the kill mechanism and sort of uh, waves away the, the asteroid. Um, but when I was writing the book, there was sort of this interesting reconciliation. So people lost professional and personal relationships over like asteroid camp versus volcano camp. Um, and I, mean, I even interviewed one guy and he said, I'm happy to talk to you about any of the mass extinctions except for the end Cretaceous, it's too political. <laughs> um, so, but there's been this interesting, when I was writing the book, an interesting reconciliation sort of an, of an idea where you know, you had this a uh, volcano sort of going along in India and then the asteroid hit and it messed up the Earth's mantle so much that it kicked it into overdrive and 
as people go back and date the most voluminous period of uh, lava, it's really close to the extinction. A couple of new studies have sort of uh, muddied the waters a little bit. Some people have it before the impact, some people have it a little after. So it's still, it's, it's this, either the biggest anti-miracle of all time that these two things were happening or there's some sort of uh, relationship between the two. But it is definitely true that the asteroid was made for a very bad afternoon yeah. 66 million years ago. So, so the, uh, I mean, you know, everybody's like, oh my gosh, these dinosaurs and there's movies about them and stuff, but they had a good run. They did. I mean, there's nothing, there's no moral to be drawn from the dinosaurs going extinct. They did nothing wrong. <laughs> and it's, it, it's a testament to their dominance that it took such a um, just ridiculous catastrophe to wipe them out. Um, they, so they dominated for 135 million years, but they show up a few tens of millions of years before that. Um, so you compare that to humans where we're on the <laughs> order of a, a fifth of a million years. Um, so if you're just an alien randomly visiting the Earth at any point in the last few hundred million years, you'd be like, this is a dinosaur planet. <laughs> Not, the, oh, it's all led up to this, to us, the, the culmination humans, of evolution. Right. No, the dinosaurs were, had every niche. Some of them were incredibly smart. Um, they were incredibly adaptive. They, kept their foot on our throats for 135 million years. We were, we were scared to death of them. We were just coming out at night out of our little burrows and stuff. Uh, so the dinosaurs were incredibly successful and it's, they didn't do anything wrong and so, and they're still around. They're, and as, one, as Paul Olson, a paleontologist at Columbia put it to me, birds are dinosaurs and that's not something that paleontologists just say to be cute. It's actually literally true, birds are dinosaurs. Um, if you look at a skeleton of a chicken and a T-Rex and a T-Rex and a Stegosaurus, the first two have a lot more in common than the second two. Um, and that's because they're both therap theropod dinosaurs. And there's, uh, I forget the numbers, but there's like 20,000 species of birds um, alive today and way fewer mammals. So you could still argue that we're living in the age of dinosaurs. So they haven't really gone away. They're still with us. So, so let's, let's go focus on yep. humans and the impact we've yep. had. I like the quote in the book, quote, like the first trees we are extraordinary in the history of life for our ability to radically alter the geochemical cycles of the planet with dramatic consequences for the climate. I mean, for one thing, you know, trees, other trees were good, but, um, but you can get into that. Uh, but, uh, but also, um, you know, we've had an impact pretty much from the beginning, right? Uh, in yes. terms of extinctions and that yeah. sort of thing, and then building up to what we're doing now. So if you could speak to that. Yeah, um, well, the tree thing is from so the second mass extinction, the, Devo the late Devonian mass extinction is a real oddball and it might actually have something to do with the evolution of trees and plant life on land. Um, which yeah, trees today are these beneficent, natural, wonderful things, which is true. But when they first showed up on the planet, it was very disruptive. There's nothing on the continents before and then suddenly you, you essentially have this giant geoengineering project of forests just taking over the continents. And one thing trees do is they are a carbon sink and it seems like there's a big ice age right at the end of the Devonian that might have to do with the fact that trees are, are sucking tons of carbon out of the air. And the other is that they're churn as they're digging the roots into the earth, they're digging up, um, they're releasing all the, they're creating soils that wash into rivers and they're releasing all these nutrients like phosphorus to the ocean, um, which is causing these anoxic dead zones. So we're doing the same thing today. We go to, we dig up phosphorus and we put it on our crops and it washes into the ocean, causes dead zones. So, um, yeah, so the analogy is, is that, that we are sort of accidentally, just like the trees, um, have been messing with Earth's geochemistry since our beginning, um, but now we actually know what we're doing and we can stop it. But yeah, the humans do, we, we tend to think of you know, environmental issues as things, you know, the last century we've really mucked things up, but it turns out that humans ever since their inception sort of as they migrate to Europe and to uh, Australia and to Pacific Islands and then to the Americas, there's this eerie wave of extinctions that follow them. Um, so in Australia, around 50, 60,000 years ago, around when the first humans show up, you lose everything over 100 kilograms on the continent. Um, and then around 12,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, when humans really start spreading out through the Americas, you lose all the mammoths and all those things. And then you bring that up to the present day where people um, have been doing these incredible, inspiring uh, journeys across the Pacific Ocean, um, you know, uh, starting new societies in Pacific Islands. You also lose all the big birds and all these big snails and things like that. So uh, 
humans have always been an apex predator that has cha fundamentally changed every ecosystem it's ever showed up in. Um, and now today we're, we're not only doing things like hunting and habitat fragmentation, but now we're really starting to pull the same levers as the, as these really bad episodes. Because you talked about how there were, there were certain uh, species that, that humans had eradicated in places where humans lived, and the, you know, the proof was, oh, but there's an island that humans hadn't lived in, and you can see that they're still there. Yeah, or yeah. had been there longer. Right, so I mean, one example of this is uh, Stellar Sea Cow, which in the, I think, 17, middle of the 1700s, was just living off this island called the Commander Islands um, in the, uh, like, Northwest Pacific. Um, and then Russians showed up, and they were all gone within, uh, you know, a decade or two. Um, but the stellar sea cow actually inhabited, you know, a lot of the Pacific coast, and it had just been extirpated except for this one island when, yep. when it was finally discovered there. So, um, yeah, and then, you know, in Antarctica, there are, I quote, some explorers who noticed when they went there that the animals just had no fear of them because they hadn't evolved with humans, and they had no reason to think that this weird little bipedal thing was actually that dangerous. So they would just be, they'd be thrilled that they could just walk up to these penguins and just slaughter them. So, um, and I would imagine when you show up and you are hungry in a new continent and there's a two-story tall giant ground sloth that isn't scared of you at all, that it would look pretty appetizing to, to want to eat it. <laughs> so so uh, getting back to the, to, the, to the big issue. Yeah. Uh, you said we're emitting a record-breaking amount of carbon dioxide 10 times faster than the worst events in the Earth's history that you've just yeah. been talking about. You said that's the, quote, take home, end quote, and that we have created, in effect, quote, the perfect storm. So speak to that. Uh, yeah, like I said, some of these events are driven, by, I mean, a lot of these events are driven by uh, huge disruptions to the carbon cycle and big injections of CO2 into the air. And right now, as far as we can tell, we're doing it faster. Um, the good news is that we're not there yet. Uh, as I said, in the worst mass extinction of all time, 96% of ocean life goes extinct. And so far in historical times, not much has gone extinct, um, in the oceans at least. We kill 270,000 sharks a day, and there isn't a, no sharks species have gone extinct. The, the planet is incredibly resilient. If we actually just let it try and recover, it will recover. The problem is that we're, we're doing all these things all at the same time. Um, we're changing the temperature, we're changing the chemistry, we're actively hunting things, and it seems like in a lot of the extinctions, they're not just they tend not to be just single cause things. It tends to be a perfect storm where, um, you know, it comes up snake eyes 10 times in a row. And it, like, you know, cause these are once every few hundred million years. They're cr incredibly rare. Um, and so in the dinosaurs, maybe the volcanoes has something to do with it, uh, making the asteroid worse. Um, and so, yeah, today we are pulling a lot of different, um, we're, so is the yeah. perfect storm temperature, chemistry, hunting, what else is in that? What, what are the things that came, come together? Hmm. That what else are we doing? <laughs> um, those, are the, those, are, those are the biggies, though. Particularly yeah, and habitat too. fragmentation's bad. I mean, especially with climate change, where um, animals are going to want to migrate to track their preferred climate. If you build a big highway and uh, housing sprawl and, or walls along borders, um, it can it will make it very difficult for animals to move around. And actually, there's an analogy in, one of the, in the first mass extinction of this in that, um, so we've been going in and out of these crazy ice ages for the last few hundred thousand years um, recently. Uh, and people have wondered when th the climate was changing that much, why weren't these, these big mass extinctions? And it's because it might have something to do with the fact that the, we are in this weird uh, situation where the continents have these long north-south uh, uh, alignments so things can move up and down. And in the first mass extinction, you might have had sort of island continents. And so when the climate changed, these things were just sort of stranded. They couldn't move anywhere. And that is sort of similar to habitat fragmentation, where we're preventing things from, from, from moving um, if they need to, if climate changes pretty radically. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, on, the, on the dreary side, what does history show it takes to rebuild an ecosystem that has suffered an extinction event? Well. So on the non-dreary side, I, <laughs> I could have just as easily written this book about the mass radiations that happen after the extinctions. So yes, you have the catastrophe, um, but in the aftermath, life is unbelievably creative and resilient um, in bouncing back from them. So uh, 
you know, you have the worst mass extinction of all time. And then, you know, 10, it did take 10 million years to recover. So that can be the time scale we're talking about. But the planet did recover in an incredible way. You had, right, it sort of give, gives birth to, the, to the, the modern world after this big mass extinction. Because within you know, 20, 30 million years, you have the first real mammals, uh, dinosaurs, modern coral reefs uh, show up first then. Um, so life is very creative and uh, bounces back from even the biggest catastrophes ever, so. So you, you cited one author, uh, one scientist, who says that the planet is potentially hundreds or thousands of years from a ma mass extinction level event. I mean, that's a big difference to say hundreds versus thousands. I mean, yeah. it's hard to tell, right? Well, so he, this is Anthony Barnowski, who's a paleontologist, who wrote a paper called Has the Earth's Six Mass Extinction Arrived? And um, the, this is considered sort of the best uh, paleontological appraisal of what we're doing today. And he says, sort of the take home message in the paper is that, well, we haven't reached the level of a major mass extinction yet, which is good because these things are completely off the charts. These are the just complete outliers mm -hmm. that we could actually get there depend, if, if depending on the, on the current rate of, that we're driving species extinct, we could actually get there in the next um, few centuries if we're really bad. Uh, to thousands of years, but the scary thing is that we don't know where, whether there might be, and there probably are, tipping points where you, know, you have these network collapses where things seem like, life seems like it's taking a beating, but you know, it's sort of a attrition, and then you might just, you might be in this house of cards situation where the whole thing uh, goes down like a power grid failure, essentially, is his analogy. So in some ways, that's encouraging because we're not there yet, and we still have time to, to save the world, and, um, I think you, a lot of times people can read headlines about, you know, are we in a mass extinction and get fatalistic and think, oh, the world's already over. Um, but it's not true. Um, there's still time to save the world. Uh, so that's encouraging, but it's discouraging that doing so is going to have, we're, we're going to have to totally rethink our sort of, our, our energy system and our relationship to nature. Um, and we have to do that pretty quick um, before, before we go over the edge. If you have questions, you might start thinking about, there's a couple of mics here. I have uh, one last question or, 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 uh, to ask Peter. Um, you got into a little bit, I was just curious uh, in the book about technologies, experimental technologies mm -hmm. that, that, that you know, might change the course of what's happening. Yeah. Do you speak to those? Um, well, so a lot of the, so the most ambitious, like the 1.5 degrees Celsius ambition for, of the Paris Climate Agreement basically relies on us inventing at a mass scale CO2 sucking machines um, that will take out, not only do we have to drop emissions to zero by mid-century, but we also have to start, then start um, actively taking it out of the atmosphere. And at this point, this technology is kind of notional. There are people that are working on it. Uh, and there's a recent Nature paper saying that by mid-century, the carbon capture industry has to be two to four times bigger than the current global oil industry to meet the Paris climate goals. So someone could get really rich if that's true. So that's, that's good, I guess. Um, Seems to be a motivation. Yeah, but, but one, one of the ways that this technology could work is that people are investigating the exact same ways that the planet has re recovers in these mass extinctions when it gets tons of CO2 goes in the air, it gets really hot, and there's this uh, mechanism called rock weathering, which um, is the planet's way of sort of cooling off over long timescales, where CO2 reacts with rainwater and it reacts with the rocks, and eventually it gets dumped into the ocean and turns into limestone. So all the CO2 we're putting in the air now, a lot of it in 200,000 years is gonna be limestone at the bottom of the ocean, or uh, sediments at the bottom of the ocean that eventually will become limestone. Um, but one of the ways to accelerate this is actually going to rocks uh, like basalt. So the Palisades across from Manhattan is part of one of the volcanoes that killed everything at the end of the Triassic. And they're actually doing experiments injecting CO2 into the Palisades and trying to transform the rock into limestone right there. And so that's a permanent way of getting rid of it. You're just turning CO2 into limestone. And so the, the planet has already figured out how to do this and we're trying to sort of take cl clues from the planet and uh, make it a technology as well. I, I would point out, I think, I think you make a, a point very cogently in the book toward the last 40 pages or so that that even short of, a, of, of going the full distance to mass extinction, even, you know, even, if it, even if it's 
is many hundreds or thousands of yeah. years. You know, there are there's social costs that could right. be born before, long before that would yes. happen that a lot of us would think of as catastrophic, right? Yeah, I think people can conflate the collapse of civilization with a proper biological mass extinction. And the threshold for the collapse of civilization might come well before that, who knows? Um, we're running this crazy experiment on the planet where uh, all of recorded history has been within you know, a degree Celsius, and we're gonna make it you know, maybe four to six degrees hotter in the next 150 years or so. Um, we have, n in a world partitioned by borders and with uh, global trade and things and uh, mass migration, you suddenly plunge the planet tens of millions of years ago into a totally alien climate, and you superimpose that on our world. Who knows what that does to sort of the, mm -hmm. the you know, society? Everything on the planet might not go extinct, but um, we do have we have to worry about ourselves a long time before even that. Let's go to questions. Uh, yep. This gentleman here was up first. Yep. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, in your Atlantic article, you said that if if they were intelligent beings during the Triassic and they had a nuclear war, we'd see no sign of it now because all of the isotopes would have decayed away. Mm -hmm. uh, However, uh, as I assume you know, uh, remains of a natural nuclear reactor were found that were almost 10 times older than that. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. So, yeah, so you're talking about something called the Eklo reactor in Gabon, which is two and a half, 2.3 billion years old or something like that. And it's actually a natural nu runaway nuclear fission reaction where uh, reduced uranium was suddenly exposed to oxygen and water, and it sort of had this runaway, um, runaway nuclear uh, reaction that the French uh, were actually concerned about. They thought people were mining uranium when they found it, and then they realized that it actually happened two billion years ago. Um, but that's, I mean, so that's, that's, those are uranium deposits. I was talking about the radioisotopes from nuclear fallout. And I was also being provocative and trying to make a rhetorical point as well. Um, but yes, it's true that you might, you, there's a very, if the dinosaurs were doing uh, global mining operations, that might be the easiest way for us to tell because a lot of the surface record isn't preserved, but sort of the rocks we're putting in holes to find coal and minerals and things like that will endure for a very long time period. So hope that helps. Thank you. To follow on that just a little bit, I was hoping you could speak to, say, let's fast forward 100 million years and humans have gone extinct, what sort of evidence of this kind of climate change and shift that's happening so rapidly now might be apparent in the fossil record? What would this moment look yeah, like question. to an alien geologist looking yeah. at rock cuts? It's an interesting question. Yeah, it would look, it would look a lot like uh, the evidence for previous climate disasters. So it would probably be... It's very rare to, you know, we have a much better high resolution picture of what life is like in the ocean than on land because things erode away on land and uh, like tend to get deposited in the ocean. Um, so we have a better picture of ocean life and, and things like that. So I would imagine that it would be a set, it would be a, you know, if it's old enough, it would be like a, a limestone where you'd have this weird sort of clay layer which would, uh, from ocean acidification, because you might, things might not be able to calcify as well. Um, and then within there, you'd be able to do geochemistry and find that uh, oxygen isotopes would tell you that it got really hot, and carbon isotopes would tell you that it, there's a big um, injection of CO2 into the air. And then if you're looking for organic biomarkers, you might find the remains of plastics, just really heavy hydrocarbons might show up um, in the oceans. Um, more speculatively, there are cities like New Orleans and Dhaka and Beijing that are sort of subsiding and getting sediment dumped on them, that if sea level went up, you could imagine they could be preserved. But you'd have to be really lucky to find, uh, to find one of those in the future. But if you did, it would be a really interesting layer, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I believe you said the uh, Permian uh, extinction, the third one out of, sorry, the fourth one out of five it's, was. It's the third. Third. Yep. Um, out, of, out of five. Yeah. Was the worst. Um, so was it the worst because the geological event was the worst or because there was more life to kill off? There wasn't more life to kill off. It might have been worse for a bunch of reasons. Um, 
So it is, I think it is the biggest large igneous province, which is what are, these volcanoes are called, um, in the last, I don't know, 600 million years. So that was really bad. You're also in a supercontinent Pangaea, which for interesting reasons might actually make it difficult for the planet to recover from. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's so off the, off the scale. So from 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south latitude, the entire tropics, um, it would have been the temperature of a jacuzzi. And um, the oceans lost almost all their oxygen and bacteria started making hydrogen sulfide in the ocean, which is this poison gas. And one guy I talked to said there might be uh, these hypercanes, which are 500 mile an hour hurricanes that were pulling this poison gas and dumping it on the land. That's just kind of a, a speculation. But it, was, it really is, it's the most extreme thing that's happened in, in the last 600 million years to animal life. Um, another weird reason it might have been, been so bad is that uh, modern plankton hadn't evolved yet. And so what's interesting is that Today we have plankton that has these sort of shells that allows them to fall deeper into the ocean before they're eaten, um, and that uses up oxygen. And so the, this thing called the oxygen minimum zone is way deeper now maybe than it was in the Permian because it was, uh, the plankton didn't sink as far, and so you had, a, you had oxygen, way, or oxygen minimum zone way higher in the ocean. So if you heat things up, you can quickly bring that onto the shelves and smother everything. And so there's all sorts of interesting reasons for why it might have been the worst um, that I think people are still trying to tease out. There was also mercury poisoning from volcanoes, and uh, the ozone layer was destroyed. Um, so yeah, it just wasn't a good time to be around. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Yep. You Sir. Absolute disaster. Um, so it seems like with every extinction, um, an underdog character from the previous era turns out in the next cycle to be the dominant species. Mm -hmm. So um, what are, is there characteristics of what happens in the first realm, like before the, the big extinction, that causes them to become the dominant species? And is there a species we should be aware of that's gonna take our place? Well, I think if you're simple and a generalist and sort of a jack, like you, like a rat or a raccoon, like we sort of scoff at them today, but uh -oh. who knows, they might just be waiting, waiting the clock out. <laughs> um, that's a great question. So yeah, in the first mass extinction, it's, it's called the sea without fish. Uh, because you had all these weird sort of creepy crawly bug-like things and then fish uh, It's recently been showed radiate after that extinction and we're you know, we're descendants of fish um, And then all these super strange fish that were highly specialized get wiped out in the nest mass extinction and then things that are more familiar to us come around um, But yeah dinosaurs were had sort of a similar uh, uh, Horatio Alger story as mammals uh, <laughs> where in the in the Triassic, they were really being dominated, but the terrestrial biosphere was dominated by these bizarre relatives of crocodiles that did everything. And um, dinosaurs really needed them to get wiped out first before they could take out the planet. Um, and then we were, then we were next on deck, uh, and waited for 135 million years. So yeah, it's these, it's these things that are, you know, I, yeah, sort of generalists who can are really. Uh, ad adaptive and clever at eking out a living, kind of, I guess, because you need to eke out a living when, when the stuff hits the fan. I guess. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was just wondering uh, what your perspective is on the burning of the Amazon rainforests right now. Uh, I think it's horrifying. Um, I've, re I've read a story that was written by another science journalist, James Temple, at MIT Technology Review, where he said that uh, there's this, there's this, could be this feedback, this runaway feedback where the, because the Amazon supplies its own weather, um, because trees are evapotranspirating and creating clouds and things like that, that w if you wipe out a certain percentage of the Amazon, you then get into this drying out feedback where the whole thing could go. And that might be at 20 to 24% of deforestation. And we've deforested 17%. Uh, so we might be getting close to this uh, threshold. I wrote a story that came out this week about how this is all horrible and we need to stop it immediately, but that oxygen actually isn't a concern. Um, and I think some people thought, took that the wrong way and thought I was saying, oh, it's all, don't worry about it. But um, no, it's, it's an incredibly biodiverse place. It's the largest tract of rainforest and humanity should do everything in its power to, to save it.
Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, I read an article by a guy named Mark P. Mills, uh, energy researcher with a, a think tank. Can't remember the think tank, but I don't know. I was a little skeptical of it from the get-go, but the article was about um, uh, the comparison of solar and wind to fossil fuels, and he was arguing that uh, the materials it takes to make solar panels and wind turbines uh, kind of end up the mining of the, those materials uh -huh. ends up offsetting the uh, carbon savings that it brings over fossil fuels. Are you uh, able to speak to that comparison uh, at all? I think he probably was not arguing in good faith. Um, there, it is true that it takes a while to, um, so I think for a wind turbine, at least this was true a few years ago, maybe it's, it's less than that, that now, but um, it takes six years to offset the carbon from the production for a wind turbine. So it's true, but then you're never using fossil fuels ever again. Um, so there are some upfront costs, but there's also, um, you know, there's no doubt that solar and wind and nuclear use less carbon dioxide than burning carbon. Um, so I don't know. I've never read anything persuasive uh, to the contrary, but I'd be interested. It is, it is true that. Uh, the materials, these rare metals, are going to be very difficult to get, and if we don't um, plan it well from the start, it could be, you know, sort of this colonial, imperial sort of thing where we're just going to countries and taking their stuff and so, and destroying the environment in, in the meantime. So we do have to, from the outset, if we're going to be using new energy sources, make sure that we're, we're doing it the right way. Um, but we need to stop burning fossil fuels. Um, unless a completely magic CO2 sucking technology is invented in the next two decades, but I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Time for one or maybe two if you're, if we're quick. Go for it. On the question of this, uh, whether we're in a six mass extinction, yeah, is does that paper represent the consensus of the paleontological community, or because I thought there was a debate about um, whether or not we're in one currently based on current background extinction rates and historical extinction. Yeah, yeah, no, no, so that's, it's a subtle paper because he argues that the rate might actually be similar to these mass extinctions. But to, to achieve a 90% 90, 90 uh, species loss, he just projects that forward um, in time. Um, and he makes the proviso that there might be unforeseen uh, tipping points. Um, so I don't think anyone would tell you that we're, it's, it's already as bad as uh, the end Cretaceous or anything like that, but it could be, and that's terrifying because these are crazy events. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> so quick question and quick answer, and then, then we have to wrap it up. So just to maybe go more of a pos positive uh, note. Last question. Last question, yeah. Uh, what? The gentleman is asking now. Uh, what can we do as simple people to kind of prevent a lot of this? Um, well, you said on a positive note, and I think I've given the impression that my book's incredibly depressing, and it's not. Um, <laughs> it's not. He's right, it's not. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think a lot of these decisions do have to be made at the top, and so I think voting is probably as, uh, as is the most important thing. Um, it's, it's great if you're using uh, you know, nice light bulbs and have solar panels on your house, but this has to be, everyone has to be pulling in the same direction as, um, you know, a society. Um, and so uh, when we're planning out how we're going to start getting energy in the coming decades, it really has to be, um, you know, those decisions have to, as virtuous as you are as a consumer, you're not going to build, uh, you know, a giant wind farm in the ocean. That is sort of a decision that has to be made by the higher-ups. Well, Peter, thanks for coming. Yeah, Boulder. thank you. It was a pleasure yeah. to talk to you.